disobedience is rather unpopular and obedience seems to be a virtue. Uh, however, this is what is said by parents, by statesmen, by almost everybody. However, before I enter into a more detailed discussion of the problem of disobedience, I should like to remind you of a few facts, maybe, and that is that human history begins, at least in the ideas of the Hebrews and uh, of the Greeks, with an act of disobedience. In fact, we wouldn't be sitting here if Adam, or rather Eve, would not have been disobedient to, the, to God's command. We would still be being in paradise, which in some ways would be nice, but we wouldn't be human, because we would still be as human as, let us say, the fetus in the womb of the mother. We would still be within nature without the specifically human qualities which uh, characterize man. Let me be a little bit more explicit, perhaps, uh, and uh, permit me to remind you of the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In this Garden of Eden, they are alive within nature, not transcending nature, not really fully human, because they have no awareness of themselves. And then, Eve, who is a more courageous and imaginative one, <coughs> persuades Adam to uh, disobey God's command. In this case, specifically to eat from the fruit which was so good to look at. And by the very act of disobedience, their eyes are opened. They become aware of themselves as different people, as strangers. There is not yet any love between them. And Adam, in fact, behaves both stupidly and cowardly in his excuses he makes and in the way he leaves uh, uh, Eve uh, taking the responsibility. But they recognize each other. They recognize that they are strangers in nature and that they are strangers to each other. And at this moment, human history begins. They are expelled from paradise. Two angels with fiery swords prevent them from ever returning. And the way of history, ha the door of, to history has been opened. Uh, indeed, from the standpoint of God's command, they disobeyed. From the standpoint of human history, their disobedience was a first act of human freedom and was a beginning of all history. Now, their opinions from this point on vary. In most of the Christian tradition, this disobedience has been considered the main sin. And in fact, in many religious and philosophical systems, the real core of any sin is disobedience. From the standpoint of the prophetic literature, however, uh, man the sinner is right. He's justified, eventually. He's justified by his own history. Because if I may remind you of the prophetic concept of the messianic time, it is a concept that man in the course of history develops his specifically human powers, specifically the power of love and of reason. That in developing this, these human powers fully, he finds a new harmony with men and with nature. Not anymore the pre-individualistic, pre-conscious, pre-historical harmony of the Garden of Eden, but a new harmony in which man is at peace with the world, in, in which man feels at home in the world. And by peace the prophets meant not only that there is no war, but by peace they meant a sense of harmony, a sense of oneness with the world, and by the world they meant both man and nature. In other words, man justifies in his history, according to the prophetic concept, his own disobedience. And you might say his disobedience was necessary for his own development. Now, the Greeks have expressed a similar idea, or rather the same idea in a different form, in Prometheus bringing culture and civilization to man by stealing the fire from the gods, by disobeying the will of the gods. He is punished much more cruelly than Adam and Eve are punished. He's chained to the rock. And yet he says, I would rather be chained to this rock 
than to be the obedient servant of the gods. In this Greek concept too, obedience, a disobedience is a beginning of human civilization. The disobedient Prometheus is really the benefactor of man, the one who by, disobedience, by his disobedience helps man to start his history, helps man to achieve freedom. Let me mention another concept of disobedience, which is of Greek origin, and that is uh, Sophocles Antigone. Antigone is confronted with a situation as I hope many of you know, that her brother had rebelled against the king, Creon, and he had lost, and usually a, lost, a, a rebel who loses is a criminal, a rebel who wins is a statesman. But since he lost, he was a criminal, and the king wanted to punish him by the utter humiliation, at least in the Greek view, of his not being buried. Antigone, his sister, was confronted with a choice between obeying the law of humanity, which is not to violate uh, a man, uh, uh, not to violate a man's dignity in his death by not burying him, or obeying the king, the laws of the king, the man-made laws of the state. She prefers to disobey the king and to obey the laws of humanity. She is killed in the process, and yet as the drama unfolds, we see that the king himself sees that the utter inhumanity of his laws have brought nothing but ruin to him and to everybody involved. Now you might say the history of, reli of religion, the history of philosophy, the history of science is a history of disobedience. Of disobedience to what? Not necessarily to the law, but of, disobe of a disobedience which is even more difficult to achieve, namely the, his the disobedience to common sense, to public opinion. Quite a few people may be ready to disobey a law, but very few people are ready to disobey the opinion, public opinion, to disobey what most people think, because if they disobey public opinion, then indeed they are afraid of the worst thing any man is afraid of, to be ostracized. To be as ostracized as in the Bible mm, Cain was after he had killed his brother. <clears throat> well, I made these remarks in order to indicate that I believe one can show that disobedience is indeed one of the conditions for human development the capacity to say no to power to that which exists. And one might speculate that uh, while disobedience was the beginning of human history, obedience might be the end of human history. And this might come about, if it is to come about, within a few years, when the obedience of those who believe one can preserve peace and the values of freedom by nuclear war will push the buttons. And this act of obedience indeed will be the end and precisely the contrast to the act of disobedience which was the beginning. <clears throat> now let me talk about various kinds of disobedience and various psychological and moral problems which are involved there. First of all, let me speak somewhat about the obedience to conscience. Uh, I think one could differentiate between two types of conscience. One one might call the authoritarian conscience and one I have called, or one might call the humanistic conscience. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, the conscience of most people is actually the introjection or the uh, whatever word you use, the acceptance of, the, of those prohibitions and commands which are issued by the authority. I believe it is my duty to do this and to do that because I have accepted, I have identified myself with the prohibitions and commands issued by my father and later by social authorities. <coughs> 
Actually, it's very interesting that Freud, in his analysis of what is conscience, only speaks in, under the name of superego of this kind of conscience. Freud means by the little boy who is afraid of father, uh, internalizes the father, introjects the father's commands and prohibitions. The reasoning is a very interesting one. As long as I am always afraid of father, this is a very painful situation because I never know whether I'll do something wrong and father will punish me. But if I put father within myself, as it were, if I introject father's commands and father's prohibitions, then I am not in danger to disobey because it becomes part of myself and therefore I will not do the wrong thing ever because I am myself the watchman over myself. But still the contents of this kind of conscience, the contents of this superego or the content of what I call the authoritarian conscience is always determined by the rules of the authority whether they are the parents, the state, the society, whatever it is. Good and bad is not decided upon. My value judgment of good and bad is not decided upon an objective rational criterion, but is decided upon by what I am taught is good and bad, provided I have accepted this as my own inner authority. I believe I make the judgment, when in reality I only have internalized the prohibitions and commands of those I'm afraid of. And actually you will find many, many people who when they say or feel, I feel guilty, really mean I feel afraid that somebody will scold me. Now the other kind of conscience is what you might call the humanistic conscience. And that is a response of our total personality to from the standpoint of what is conducive and what is not conducive to the unfolding of human existence. That is a, a voice which calls us to ourselves, namely the voice, if you please and forgive me, to use what seems to be such a loose and unscientific expression, the voice of life. The voice of a man or woman who is alive and who is sensitive to everything that is destructive of life and sensitive to everything that is furthering life. This humanistic conscience may differ very much and may be in contrast to the authoritarian conscience. It will be in contrast, in fact, as long as society is not identical or the interest of any given society or any given authority is not identical with the interests of humanity or with the interest of man as man. Now it is quite clear that disobedience to the authoritarian conscience is something quite different from disobedience to the humanistic conscience. Namely, the disobedience to authoritarian conscience will precisely very often occur because we obey our human conscience. And we may obey the authoritarian conscience because we disobey our human conscience. This is precisely the case of Antigone. This is precisely the man the history of all martyrs, whether they were martyrs for philosophical truth or for religious truth or political truth, they always refused to obey the conscience which was essentially the internalization of the state's authority's laws because they felt a higher obedience to the conscience which represented the voice of humanity in them. In fact, We ought to consider one thing. This is just a footnote to the problem. But uh, since we are talking about this, the footnote might not be out of order. We are actually accustomed in our Western culture to do the right thing because it is our duty, because it's our moral obligation. And very often that works. It hasn't been too successful actually. But I want to remind you of a tremendous danger of doing the right thing because it is our obligation. Because if a state or society or any leading figure says it's your obligation to kill, provided we obey obligation as an order by the authority, then indeed we are right in killing. 
then indeed there is nothing in human which is not only justified, but which is our duty to do, provided this order is issued by the authorities who say it is your duty. This indeed is what has happened in the last war, that people have done the most cruel things in the feeling that since the state ordered it, it was their duty to do it. And once the problem of duty, of moral obligation, is essentially connected with the idea, as Eichmann said in his primitive version of Kant, that Maine's main ethical obligation is to fulfill orders and to do his duties, to his duty, then indeed nothing protects us from doing the most cruel and inhuman thing in the name of morality. There is another motivation for doing the right thing, and that is a motivation much closer to Eastern thinking, for doing the right thing because it pleases us to do it. Where the education of a person is not the education to be able to do his duty as that difficult and sacrificial thing as most of us feel it, but to develop his personality in such a way that that which is good is also agreeable. Now by agreeable I do not mean that it is a pleasure in the sense of Bentham of a pleasure principle or anything of that kind, but that it agrees with us. Let me give you a very simple example for what I mean. In our bodily posture, we are usually, we waver between two extremes. Either we slouch, and that we call relaxing, or we do what we learn in uh, gymnastics. We have this uh, tense, uh, unrelaxed attitude. Now there's actually a third possibility, and that is a complete balance of the body, which is neither slouching, nor is it tense, which one has to learn, in fact, in order then to enjoy it. But if you sit, if you have learned to sit in a way in which your whole body feels good, in which you are neither, uh, in this sense, relaxed nor, nor tense, but in which your whole body is in a pleasant harmony, in a pleasant balance, then indeed you have a posture which is both right from the standpoint of the body and it is agreeable, it agrees with you. Now, I hope you don't underestimate the significance of the way one sits or the way one walks or the way one, or, or, of the significance of any gesture. This is indeed much more significant as talking about God and many other ideas because to talk about God and freedom is very easy. To move one's body in such a way that one has, that one's body is in a, in a right position is indeed something which is much more real than words and it takes also much more time to learn it. What I meant to say is that in the proper way of education, in the proper way of the formation of a personality, I believe that the right way of teaching virtue, if I may use old-fashioned words, is not to teach duty, but to teach the development of the personality in such a way that that which is good becomes a pleasure, becomes agreeable, that a person, feel, a person feels better in loving than in hating, that a person feels better in responding to the world rather than being stingy, and so on and so on. If one has attained this, then indeed an inhuman order can never be experienced as one's duty because one does not worship duty anymore, but one is very responsive to the voice of life within oneself. A second problem is uh, connected with obedience or disobedience is obedience or disobedience to authority. And here again, I should like to make a distinction which is similar to the one I made with regard to conscience. Namely, the distinction between what you might call rational authority and irrational authority. By rational authority, I mean anyone who has a competence by virtue of which he has a certain authority over other people. That is to say, the teacher who teaches something, or the captain of a ship who usually 
may not do too much, but in case of a fire or a disaster, he is really responsible and he will tell people what to do. And only a fool would say, I'm against authority, so I will not do what the captain says. Or only a very foolish student will refuse to learn because that is an authoritative method. In fact, there are many foolish students these days, and I'm afraid some foolish teachers too, who don't dare to say, if the student says two and two are five, the teacher feels, or the student might feel, this is a very authoritarian method to say it is wrong. And uh, some people feel the student should express himself. Well, I personally do not believe in this kind of teaching, which goes in the name of liberalism, freedom, self-expression, what not. I think it's destructive of any sound development of the human mind. Now, uh, in contrast to rational authority is irrational authority, in which the person, uh, which is characterized by several factors. First of all, it is not based on competence but on power. It is not acknowledged because of my recognition of the competence, but it's acknowledged by my fear of the person with superior power. But it is usually rationalized as if it were an authority of competence. Uh, one of the things by which I was most impressed when I was 13 or 14 was when we learned in school, I think it was a Swedish Chancellor Oxenstierna who is suppo supposed to have said to his son before he died that the only thing that could leave him was one piece of wisdom and that was th that he could never overestimate with how much stupidity the world was governed. Uh, I was very much impressed by that just as I was impressed by my Latin teacher, who, when I was in, from the year 1912 to the year 1914, when we had Latin impressed upon us always, the Latin saying, if you want peace, prepare for war. And then when the First World War broke out in 1914, I noticed how happy he was. And I noticed then that he could not quite have meant what he said when he was so concerned for the preservation of peace. And since then, I'm rather immune against all the teachings which say that by war preparation one secures peace. But that is only a personal footnote. What I wanted to say was that irrational authority governs by power, is acknowledged by fear, but rationalized as competence. Because irrational authority makes it appear as if it were competent, and once you are afraid enough, you prefer to believe that the person who is, whom you are afraid of is competent rather than to admit you are yourself that you just acknowledge him out of fear. Uh, nobody likes to be afraid and everybody prefers to persuade himself that his leaders are wise and competent in order not to appear of what he usually is to himself, namely sheep. Uh, in other words, only if we recognize the difference between rational and irrational authority, authority by competence and authority by exploitation and power, only then can we really appreciate the difference of obedience and of disobedience with regard to the authority. I don't have to explain any further that disobedience to rational authority is different from disobedience to irrational authority, and the same holds true for obedience. But if we don't make this difference, then indeed we are pretty, getting pretty confused because then indeed we mix up obedience and disobedience regardless of whether it's towards rational or irrational authority and hence we are pretty much lost in our judgment of what any of these things mean. Of course, it is very important if we speak about uh, authoritarian conscience and human conscience about rational and irrational authority, not to forget one basic fact of human history, and that is that so far there has never been a society in which the full interest of humanity, the full interest of man's unfolding, the full respect for life was identical with the aims of society. Every society makes it appear that this is the case. Uh, and if it isn't the case, like in classic Greece, then a man like Aristotle says, well, the slaves are just not fully human. Hence, everything is all right. That is a simple thing to do. 
And uh, when uh, the slaves were brought over from Africa, well, they had the benefit of becoming Christians or some such things, those who survived the trip. That is also um, a, a way of uh, negating the fact that interest of society was not coinciding with the interest of humanity. I would say any, the only criterion for any society from a humanist standpoint is precisely to what extent this society is fulfilling the interests of man or of humanity and to what extent it is in conflict with it. From a standpoint of a humanist, one will want to see the gap. One will want to see the difference because if one wants to obey one's conscience in a sense of a human conscience, then indeed one has to be aware of the conflict between a number of social interests and a number and human interests which conflict with them. In other words, to speak biblically, one has to be aware of the difference between God and Caesar. The Bible says, give God what is God's and give Caesar what is Caesar's. But today, many people think that all that is Caesar's is also God's. And hence, one can give everything to Caesar and pretend one gives everything to God. Uh, that is very simple and very convenient, but it is indeed neither Christian nor humanist. Now, why is disobedience so difficult? Now, you might say it's not difficult at all because children are so often disobedient. But indeed, only a few years are needed and the disobedience is uh, driven out of them and they become like their parents, very obedient, however, with the illusion that they do precisely what they want to do. I come back to this point in a few minutes. Now, the disobedience, I think, is so difficult because there is such a great premium in obedience. If I obey, then indeed I have no responsibility. If I obey, then those are responsible whom I obey. Or let me put it perhaps a little bit uh, in a, uh, somewhat more general terms. Uh, man is in every moment of his life confronted with the same struggle which the infant is confronted in the moment of being born. One part of him wants to go, to come to the light, one part wants to be born, and one part struggles against being born. Now, this passion to, to return to the womb, to return to where we come from, to return to the state of darkness and unindividuality, to return to complete security, to return to a state where we, have not, where we do not have to make decisions, where we do not even have to breathe by ourselves. This is a tremendously strong passion. Freud has used the word incest. He has, as one of the in his thinking, strongest passions in men. Now, he had a peculiarly rationalistic concept of incest. And that is that here is a little boy, and the little boy has already a sexual, um, sexual feelings. The mother is a woman whom he knows most intimately. Hence, he has sexual feelings with regard to mother. Now, in the first place, this is, isn't quite so, uh, but uh, sometimes it may happen, but this all would be relatively unimportant. In fact, the sexual instinct per se is notoriously fickle. That would not create the tremendous, uh, the tremendous dependencies, fixations to mother, to blood, to soil, to the nation, the clan, the tribe, if all this was essentially the result of a sexual fixation. No, the problem of incest is a much deeper and a much more serious one. Namely, it is a wish not to be fully born. It is a wish to remain part of nature, part of mother, part of the tribe, part of what, uh, of blood and soil, of avoiding the fear of being fully born. And that means to be responsible for oneself, to be alone in the world, provided we do not succeed of loving somebody and loving ourselves and loving mankind. 
uh, the power which holds us back to the dark caves of incestuosity, if I could you, uh, coin this word, this power is perhaps the strongest passion which exists in human life. This is the power of tribalism, this is the power of nationalism, this is the power of all those fanatic beliefs in which a person uh, be, remains part of an organization, uh, uh, a group, which protects him, which makes him feel one with it, and in which he refuses to be fully born. Now, if I speak here fully born, I'm not really being poetic, although it's not precisely a scientific way of putting things. But in psychology, really, sometimes the poetic way of putting things is the most precise one, or rather the most, if you please, scientific one, because the so-called the so-called scientific words in psychology, that is to say in the world of understanding men, are really quite useless because our language does not have such words. Now we don't have any words for most important feeling experiences. I mean we have many words for various kinds of cars uh, and we have many words for the things which seem important to us, but we don't have many words for differentiating feelings. You have to go to poetry or to mythology or to the great literature of finding the words which would adequately refer to the most essential experiences. Well, it might not be so bad because most people don't feel much anyway. So uh, they don't miss the words. But in a way it is bad too because our own awareness of experience is greatly hindered if our language has no words for it. And it is uh, probably a vicious circle in which we find ourselves in this. Uh, now, this was all a footnote uh, apropos of the question of incest. I was saying that the difficulty of disobedience lies in the fact that we are so frightened of freedom, that we are so frightened of, mo of being born, that we are so frightened of moving out of the security which is the tie to the past. We are so frightened of experiencing something new. We talk a great deal about adventurousness and initiative and risk-taking and what not, individualism. Practically the only place in which this takes place are the Western, um, Western movies. A good Westerner is a nostalgic satisfaction of our wish for risks and adventurousness when in real life the organization of men of the 20th century has become as security-minded and unadventurous as perhaps any population has ever been in the world. Uh, that is only one aspect of that same fear to uh, be disobedient, to move out from that which makes us feel secure because we belong. And yet, in disobedience, in the capacity to say no, lies indeed the condition for the freedom of man and for the development of the whole man. A man can meaningfully say yes only if he can also say no. If he cannot say no, his yes means nothing. His agreement, his obedience, his allegiance, his loyalty means nothing if he has no choice, if he has no alternative because then it is just the noise of sheep when he says yes. It's not the voice of a man who can say yes if he is not capable of saying no. Um, and indeed, I'm afraid if we continue, our Western society continues the way we are going, the capacity of saying no will soon disappear. Now. That also is very much marked in the process of education. Uh, uh, Fifty years ago, when mother, uh, our father, didn't want Johnny to do something, he said, now Johnny, if you do that, I'll spank you. And he did spank him if he did it. Well, that is not, of course, progressive. Uh, it's not a democratic method. But it has one great advantage. Johnny knows precisely that he is, he is an order, he knows who gives the order and he knows what the sanction is. Now today mother says, oh Johnny, I'm sure you don't want to do that, with a smile. Now what's Johnny supposed to do? Can you rebel against a smile? Can you rebel against sweetness? 
And what is a sanction? The sad face of mother. Now, it is better to endure 10 spankings than to endure the sad face of mother with almost tears in her eyes. And Johnny again has disappointed her. Uh, however, this is a much more efficient method of producing obedience than the old-fashioned method of the 19th century. If you read a book like Butler's, The Way of All Flesh, then you see that this was a fight against authority, against overt authority, in which indeed the character of a person was formed. Many broke down, but many came to life in this fight. And in fact, it is unthinkable to understand the 19th century or the 18th century if we do not understand that this was a century in which authority was still overt, explicit, and in which people had the courage and the capacity to fight authority. This formed the character of people. Many submitted, but many didn't. What do we see today? What is the problem of obedience and disobedience in a bureaucratic society, uh, in the society of organization men. In the first place, of course, we have an anonymous authority today throughout. There are no orders. There are only pension plans. That is to say, once you enter the system, you know, and the older you get, the more children you have, the more serious the problem becomes. You are well taken care of, if you don't have wrong ideas. In fact, uh, people are not even aware that they might have wrong ideas. Everybody agrees. Uh, you find sometimes that the people in the organization privately have different ideas from the ideas they write about, especially if they are members of the press or, uh, well, of the big, uh, big in, uh, well, I don't want to mention any names. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then um, indeed uh, the people are sometimes aware that privately they think one thing, when they write, they write another thing. But most of the time people are not really aware that they are obeying an anonymous, anonymous authority. Most people, most of the time the people are under the illusion that what they think is precisely what they choose to think. They repress the fact that their thinking is to a large extent obedience to the anonymous authority. That is to say, to those hints, rules, uh, prescriptions, norms, which are presented to them, but not as orders, but as common sense. In fact, our authorities today are not so much uh, authorities as they were, and not so much, they are very rarely so, authorities that existed in the 19th century. But our authorities are common sense, public opinion, practicality, anon anonymous powers against which you can really not fight. Who can fight against common sense? Who can fight of that which sounds reasonable? And aside from that, we have other authorities, these are the experts. Now the experts uh, prove their incompetence again and again. But the average man, citizen, seems to be willing to be slaughtered rather than to doubt the experts. Because the experts teach him that he knows absolutely nothing. Uh, and that problems are that so complicated that nobody can understand them except the experts. And the average man is so convinced by this kind of brainwashing that he doesn't even notice that the experts have blundered again and again and again. We have gone through two world wars now, and these two world wars were blunders from the beginning to end. The way they started, the way they were conducted, and the way peace was concluded. All these were blunders which led to more disasters, and yet the average man stood in the trenches or lived in the trenches for four years in the First World War. Hundred, millions and millions were slaughtered in air raids in the Second World War, and everybody still believed in the wisdom of the experts. Why? Because it is simple. Simpler, it seems. One pays with one's life. One pays with one's happiness. But one does not have the to face the fact that I'm a man only, 
if I can think by myself, if I can judge by myself, if I am not uh, impressed by the fact that somebody brainwashes me, and in fact, uh, what I call brainwashing, while it is practiced, I am sure, uh, to a very extreme point in China, it is by no means something which is unknown in our Western world. Of course, we don't call it brainwashing. We call it uh, education or enlightenment. And of course, the Chinese don't call it brainwashing either. They call it uh, the improvement of man or something. Uh, 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 Nobody calls himself names, he calls only the other one's names. If we arm, it's for defense. If they arm, it's for aggression. They say the same. And so both arm. And uh, everybody is happy until the moment where the thing explodes. Indeed, the modern man has lost the capacity of being disobedient because he has lost the capacity of even recognizing authority. The organization man cannot be disobedient because the only principle which he recognizes is the bureaucratic principle that what matters is the good functioning of the organization. There is no other morality in the bureaucratic principle than the functioning of organization. When I was reading uh, the Eichmann trial, I must confess, I could not sense any indignation against the man in the sense that this is an evil man. Uh, indeed, he is a callous man, but actually he is the organization man. For him it did not make any difference whether he shipped coal or Jews, or whether he would have shipped Jews for export or Jews for extermination. The organization man is not even evil. He is not a man anymore. And I think the problem of good and evil has changed. Good and evil both are human. The evil is human too. The evil is in me, the evil is in you. And if you are sufficiently uh, rooted in tribal uh, tribalism, then you will do something most of us do in any war and even in the Cold War, you will project all the evil which you have in yourself to your enemy and the result is very simple. Your enemy is a devil and you are an angel. What could be simpler? By the very simple act of projection, which is one of the most frequent mechanisms. If you are, do not lose contact with your own humanity and with humanity in general outside of you, then indeed you know that it is possible to love one's enemies, that this is not a a strange and unrealistic demand because if one feels the good and evil in oneself, if one feels all of humanity in oneself, then there is no more enemy. Then there is no more judgment in which I am superior to anyone else because then I know the evil in the other one is my evil and the, my goodness is in him too. We may be different in accent, in, in structure, in quantity of the evil and yet we are not basically different in as much as an other one, the other one is basically evil and I am basically good. And of course the thing becomes all the more ridiculous as we have seen in the last few years that the devils of yesterday become the angels of today and the angels of today become the devils of yesterday. What do we know? What five years from now uh, by some political constellation who will the devils then be? Uh, What I meant to say was that in the age of the organization man, in the age of the ever-growing bureaucratization of our society, that the problem of good and evil disappears and then something new appears which is true hum in humanity, namely not evil, which is, as I said, is not inhuman. But when man is transformed into a thing, he does not feel anything anymore when he treats himself like a thing, relates himself to other people like things, when this stage is achieved, then indeed we have inhumanity in the proper sense of the word, 
which is quite different from evilness, which is not inhuman, although it is bad. And in this sense, I believe, when I was impressed, that this man Eichmann is a symbol of all of us, is a symbol of where we are going. It's a symbol of the organization man for whom right and wrong is identical with the, ru with the good or bad functioning of the organization and who has ceased to make human judgments, who does not respond humanly anymore, and hence for whom it is impossible to be disobedient because he is so much part of the machine, part of the bureaucratic apparatus, that he can be as little disobedient as a little cog in the machine can be disobedient to the machine. Indeed, I believe that today we are confronted with a very serious problem, namely with the problem of increasing bureaucratization, of losing increasingly our sense of individuality, and I don't believe these are cries of people who do not, uh, and more and more people are aware of this, who uh, are overly pessimistic. It is quite clear that obedience and disobedience are not opposites. On the contrary, if I can only be, be disobedient, I am a fool. And if I can only be obedient, I am a sheep, or maybe I am a fool too. Every meaningful obedience implies a disobedience to something else. And every meaningful disobedience implies obedience to something else. The problem is that if one builds up a life in which disobedience is not experienced anymore, then indeed what we deal with is a fake obedience. It's the obedience of the machine part, and it's not anymore human obedience. And I think we have to learn to separate between God and Caesar. We have to learn to understand whether we feel our loyalty to the idol of the national state or our loyalty, if you are religious, you will say to God, and if you speak in non-theological language, you will say to humanity and the conscience which is rooted in it. But at least I think it is important that we are honest and that we don't fool ourselves by assuming a harmony which just does not exist. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fromm, for a most interesting and stimulating talk. Dr. Fromm has uh, consented to, to answer questions now from the audience, and uh, we will now proceed with this. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, just a reading to the comment on obedience and push button warfare. Uh, yesterday, uh, it was reported that our chief disarmament uh, negotiator, Arthur Dean, uh, commented or proposed that uh, the world and the USSR outlawed the books and writings of uh, Marx, Stalin, and Lenin. Uh, as a uh, scholar of Marx's works, what, is, what are your thoughts regarding this? Well, uh, it is hard to have any thoughts about as thoughtless a remark as Mr. Dean made it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, he hasn't even discovered that Marx, Lenin, and Stalin are about as different among each other as uh, three writers could be, but he does a very nice service to the Russians by lumping, lumping them together. This is what Stalin and Khrushchev are trying to persuade the world for f almost 40 years now, that Marx, Stalin, Stalin uh, Lenin, and Stalin are all the same. And uh, since probably Mr. Dean, with all due respect, has not read a line of Marx, because if he had, he couldn't truthfully or meaningfully make any, any such statement, uh, he is just confirming a Russian ideology. I don't think that Mr. Khrushchev has read much of Marx either, 
because uh, I, uh, the fact is that Marx is not even quoted much in Russian scientific literature. Uh, uh, he is read about as much in, well, no, I was going to say he's about as much read in Russia as the Bible is in the West, but that isn't quite true because I'm sure the Bible is read somewhat more than Marx is read in Russia. Uh, I guess uh, Mr. Khrushchev has about the knowledge of Marx which would correspond to a Sunday school knowledge which somebody acquires in our country about Western religion. Uh, but really, the remark is just shocking, not only because it's, a, it's such a thoughtless remark, but also because uh, we suddenly, um, it is one of the really of the crudest distortions the Russians make the proposal to forbid war propaganda uh, in all countries, and Mr. Dean answers by forbidding Marx as if Marx had been a propagandist for war, and then he quotes one sentence from the Communist Manifesto, uh, which seems to uh, substantiate that it's hardly uh, possible to say more uh, about this, and that is just a very regrettable remark. <laughs> Yes. So you talk about the uh, national authority of the teacher, and uh, I remember that in your interview you wrote an introduction to uh, A.S. Neal Summerhill, and I wonder if you can care to comment on uh, how the national authority of there in the philosophy education. You mean in Summerhill? In Summerhill. Yeah. Well, uh, the qu I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question was uh, how I relate the problem of the rational authority of the teacher to a book by Niels uh, called Summerhill, which some of you I'm sure know, which is a report on his uh, system of teaching uh, without, let us say, force and fraud. That is, I think, its best characterization. Now, I uh, think uh, Mr. Niels does not insist even on the authority of his competence, but he does insist on one thing, that he doesn't lie. He makes one statement, that he has never lied to a child. Now that's a great thing to say, and I'm sure he is perfectly, uh, this is a perfectly sincere and truthful statement. He does not use force, he does not use deception, and in fact he has qu some quite remarkable results. I remember a case he describes in his book, where a boy comes which had, who had been fired from a school because of uh, some, I forgot exactly what it was, some rather troublesome behavior. And uh, he comes, he's 15 years old, he comes in Neil's office and Neil says, you want a cigarette? And the boy who thinks that's not the proper thing to say says, oh no sir. And uh, Neil says to him, oh don't lie, here, smoke. And then he says, you know, do you know some of the tricks how to ride a railroad without paying a ticket? And the boy is completely shocked that this, the teacher, the authority, would say this. Well, he explains him some of the tricks, but later on, the boy finds out that this was a decisive hour of change in his life. Because for the first time, he believed that somebody meant what he said. Well, most of us don't, with most people. Uh, now, I think, in contrast to much of what goes as progressive education these days, Neil's system which I think depends a great deal on a man with the sincerity and courage and humanity Niels has, is one which can be characterized as a system in which there is no irrational authority whatsoever. Because not only is there no force used, but also not the pretense of a wisdom which is not authentic. Could you repeat the questions? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. We should obey what is agreeable for life in general as a primary motive, the humanistic approach. What are the tests of this? Uh, how does what, I, I realize it's difficult to know, but what are these tests? Well, the question is I have said that we should do what is agreeable in life and what are the tests of this. Now in the first place I, am, I must uh, redefine what I said or repeat what I said. I didn't say what is agreeable but I said what agrees with us 
and I especially mention this is not meant as pleasure in the traditional sense of the, let us say, of, of, of pleasure in the, uh, of Bentham's and other philosophers' ideas. Now, you ask me, what is a test? The way how vital you feel, how alive you feel, how well you feel, how much energy you have, how your relationships are to other people, how serious, how genuine they are. The tests of, I would say, virtue is the aliveness of a person, and by aliveness I don't mean uh, that just that he has much physical energy because that declines with the years, but the inner aliveness which makes him responsive to the world, sensitive to the world, if you please that he listens when somebody talks, now you may say most people, everybody listens. No, they don't. We hear, but we don't listen to anybody. That's why people go to psychiatrists so often, because at least there's somebody who listens. <laughs> uh, there are many tests uh, for well-being. Uh, people who only can repeat cliches, for whom feeling is nothing but a thought of feeling who feel lame and tired and who live only with a small portion of their potential energy, these people are indeed not well. And of course it is a very complicated topic to describe the connection between, if you permit me again the old-fashioned term, virtue and well-being, between doing what is right and doing what agrees with our human nature. There is one thing which I might add here as a footnote. You see, if you have as your main principle doing your duty, then of course you must be terribly afraid of ever sinning. If you have the principle which Goethe and other philosophers have expressed that what matters is being alive, then you are not so terribly concerned you might have sinned or not, because it really doesn't matter as long as you are alive and evolving and emerging and being born every day. But if you are not alive, then you have, and you want to be good, then you have to be terribly concerned with your own sins and usually even more with the sins of others. And then you live with indignation either against yourself or others, but there isn't much well-being in this process. Yes, sir. Positive, you said? <laughs> no, no, I really didn't and wasn't sure. Did you say positive? Uh, I said you have expressed a rather caustic. Oh, caustic, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Positive remarks about our society. Uh, and you've also discussed the uh, virtue of the human being and the ability to say no. Now, I wonder uh, about your own personal in, let's say, in an event purely hypothetical, if you're 62 now, it wouldn't be called for service, but in an event there, there was a war tomorrow, or the next few weeks, and you were called for service, what would you do? Well, I think I would refuse to fight, because I would take the stand that war at this age is not con is not, uh, cannot be squared with my belief. Uh, in this sense, I consider myself a pacifist. I am not precisely a pacifist, but at this day and age, indeed, I believe that the use of violence cannot accomplish any of the aims we say it does and leads merely to destruction. I would identify myself with those who are conscientious objectors in one or the other form. Yes, sir. Um, you have taken a straightforward stand. We all applaud. We are spoken to very often these days by proponents of Zen. I think you find us thinking sympathetic. Uh, 
but it's been attacked as a philosophy of avoidance, of quietism. It usually applies to Zen. Man is beyond good and evil. Can you give us some comments on this? Uh, the question was that uh, I uh, I have sympathies with Zen and that it's uh, I often said that the Zen man is beyond good and evil. Well, I don't consider myself an authority of Zen, hence uh, I really cannot make uh, responsibly a statement about Zen. But I have read many books about Zen. I had the privilege of having many conversations with Dr. Suzuki. And I indeed believe that uh, the idea that, which for instance Mr. Watts has expressed in recently, that Zen is just a technique and has nothing to do with good and evil, this is not the Zen I have read and this is not the Zen I have learned from Dr. Suzuki. I think the Zen is basically a Buddhist development and Buddhism is not beyond good and evil. Buddhism is based on the compassion of man with all sentient beings, of a sense of identity with all life, which is not at all a technique of certain kinds of uh, perceptions. Now, it is clear that Zen has often been misused by, uh, in Japan, by certain social classes for their purposes. So has Christianity, so has every religion. It is also clear that Zen, uh, at least to me it is clear, that Zen does not primarily think in moral terms, but that Zen primarily thinks in terms of a transformation which creates certain attitudes to the world which then have not to be acted upon as a duty but as a natural consequence of a change in a person. I'm sure there are many problems in that and I have often discussed them with Dr. Suzuki but I personally believe that the attitude of Mr. Watts namely that uh, Zen is just a technique and that those who expect any moral element in it are just not understanding it uh, I cannot argue with him because certainly he knows he has, knows more about Zen than I do, but it certainly is not what I have understood from my knowledge of Zen. You mentioned that uh, there is too much conformity, too much of the organization man, not enough disobedience, and yet actually we have a tremendous amount of disobedience, I guess the disobedience to the, irration, to the rational, in our juvenile delinquency in other countries, in the teddy boys in Russia, another form. Why do we have this kind of disobedience and not the disobedience that would be the kind you are asking for? Because there's nothing... Well, let me... Oh, I better repeat the question first. I said we have little disobedience in a meaningful way, and yet we have a, a tremendous amount of disobedience in the form of juvenile delinquency and so on. And that's perfectly true. We have it, the Russians have the same phenomenon. The Russians have it even worse. Some of you will have read that the Russians a few weeks ago uh, introduced a law in which rape is punished by capital punishment. Now, that is a very embarrassing thing, I'm sure, to the Ru uh, Russian government, because in general they have, don't have capital punishment except for political crimes. And uh, to introduce capital punishment for rape simply shows what dimensions this has uh, in Russia and how the young generation is uh, a delinquent generation, I mean not the whole generation, but many of them, uh, probably even worse than it is with us. Now, this disobedience, I think, uh, is simply a symptom of the emptiness of life. Uh, it is simply a symptom of what uh, um, precisely that there is nothing to obey to and if that there's nothing to believe in, that there's nothing to which gives a person a true aim in life except to buy more things and use more things. Well, that is a state of uh, a psychological state, just of, of anarchy in the negative sense of the word, of confusion, and I think some people show their protest, that many people show their protest towards a meaningless life by becoming delinquents. There, in other words, to put it in other terms, there is not a meaningful authority which they could believe in. And in fact, uh, to make a footnote apropos of this, with regard to the Russians, 
the Russians have, as far as I understand from reading the English translations of the Russian press and many other articles and books, the Russians have precisely the same difficulty we have. Their young people especially, but the older people not so much either, but their young generation does not believe in communism. And our young generation doesn't believe in God. But they say they believe in communism and we say we believe in God. The whole point is neither one of these beliefs has traction. Neither one of these beliefs has reality to the people. It doesn't motivate them. And hence the Russians see as the only solution to keep the people in line to provide more consumer goods. And what do we do? I think pretty much the same. Uh, it's in, uh, we don't have always to repeat that there is indeed a difference between the degree of uh, freedom in the Western system and the lack of it in Russia. In Russia I couldn't give this lecture uh, and here I can. But uh, the point is nevertheless that it is an observable fact that in spite of the fact that we have rather complete freedom of expression, the majority of people think precisely the same uh, just as any American uh, traveler in Russia notices with naive surprise that the Russians think all the same. They all ask the same question, so do we. Well, I think if we are serious about democracy, if we are serious about our future, if we are serious really about uh, the tradition of our society, then indeed it is time that we wake up and begin begin to question ourselves what a human life is, what independence is, what decision is, what conviction is, and to see the difference between a conviction and an opinion. Yes, sir? I'd like to ask you two somewhat related questions. First, how do you suggest the individual may form an opinion when the experts disagree? And secondly, what practical advice do you have to the citizen who cares to disagree with, or rather disobey with the experts who he does disagree? I repeat the question, and please correct me if I'm not uh, precise. The first question is, what possibility has individual to form an opinion when even the experts disagree? And secondly, uh, how can he make his voice heard? Well, you know, uh, in the first place, think of the institution of a jury. So here are 12 men who are supposed to decide a complicated case and two lawyers confusing them precisely as much as the statesmen of both blocks confuse their populations, giving a completely different picture, which one is looking from here, the other one is looking from here, so I'm completely right and the other one is wrong and vice versa. And yet we expect these 12 men who are not experts, after hearing all the evidence, and what is worse, after listening to the confusing statements of the uh, prosecutor and of the attorney for the defense, they are supposed to decide the case. In fact, often to decide on the life of a man. Now, I'm not saying they're always right, but I do say we assume that in principle they can do that. Now, I don't think the facts of foreign policy are really more complicated than um, the facts of a murder case uh, very often is, or, uh, or theft, or, or any other things which is decided by a jury. Um, I think it is important to be critical, to be in a critical mood, to sift the evidence, and uh, to really ask the experts that their opinion is made credible. That is to say that they really prove their case, that they really prove their competence, and that they don't tell us stories uh, which uh, uh, they, don't not, they do not try to prove. There are some things which are really very difficult for laymen, namely certain technical problems. I think the matters of foreign policy are perfectly understandable for any layman who wants to think. They do not require more intelligence than for anyone to make a living and to bring up his children. It's a very difficult business to live, provided he has a wish to understand it and take these things seriously. Uh, I think the trouble is that we begin from, from the very beginning, we do not believe that's any of our responsibility. But I would say this, 
If the indi individual citizen abdicates his capacity to judge the facts of foreign policy, what is left for democracy then? Because then the most important decision of today, the most important decisions on armament and on basic decisions on foreign policy are something which are completely out of the reach of the individual citizen. Well, the second question is very hard to answer in a minute. How can one make oneself heard? I would say, first of all, by not waiting for anybody to tell one how one can do it, but by doing it. We don't have so many channels as we would like to have, or as it would seem we ought to have, for the individual citizen to make his voice heard. But it is, I think, a very fortunate event in American life that in the last two, three years, there's a great activity of citizens in the matters of defense, of, re of disarmament, of foreign policy, and certainly that many more people think and uh, discuss things than they used two, three years ago. Sir? Well, Dr. Strom, I <coughs> merely wanted to point out the distorted view that you presented in your argument concerning the jury, where two lawyers tr are confusing the jury. Don't forget we have a judge who sifts the evidence, and there's a, the law of evidence which allows the evidence in to the case for the consideration of the jury. Uh, the remark was that uh, the gentleman points out to my distorted view of the comparison with the jury, namely that after all in the jury case there is a judge who instructs the jury there are certain laws of evidence and so on. Well sir, I uh, accept your correction but I uh, still think it does not entirely destroy my analogy and it was meant uh, in a way as an analogy because after all in spite of the judge it is a jury who has and in spite of the laws of evidence and what's admissible and what is not, the jury eventually has a responsibility to decide about the basic facts in the case, namely whether, for instance, it believes the story of the defendant, whether it believes that certain witnesses who, who have uh, given witness to the contrary and so on and so on are right or wrong. In other words, the juror has the obligation to sift out of very much contradictory evidence what he considered to be the facts. It's true, he is helped by the judge, and I wished we had at least uh, somebody at the function of a judge in our, who could help the uh, citizen in thinking about foreign policy. We don't. So in this respect, uh, my analogy was not uh, entirely correct, but uh, I only meant to say we have some trust in people in this situation that in spite of much conflicting evidence, they can find out uh, the facts, although it is difficult. And I only meant to say that I think in matters of foreign policy, it is really not so much more difficult, although uh, it is difficult enough. But uh, I also would say that in private life, people often are in a difficult situation in which, in one way or another, because they apply themselves to it, they come to conclusions which are rather valid, while in the life of society most people are sufficiently alienated that they don't feel really it is their own business. It is something they are responsible for. They feel, let them do it, that is to say, those who are specialized in this field, and I think for that things are much too serious and dangerous to uh, follow this principle. Yes, sir? Uh, I would like to hear uh, from your uh, opinion on uh, the motives of the uh, students who took part in the City Hall riot a few years back. City Hall riots? Uh, where? <laughs> Pardon me? Oh. Well, I'm awfully sorry. I don't remember sufficiently what happened, uh, it's probably very uh, alive in your own memory because it was here, but I really don't remember the details, so I couldn't possibly comment on it. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I, uh, I'm no, that does not mean that I admire the committee, uh, <laughs> but uh, 
I just do not remember the details of what happens in, in any such way that I could comment on it. I am afraid it's 9.30 and uh, according to your custom but also according to my state of tiredness it is time to end. <laughs>